Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Gabor Lukac. I'm the president of Air Passenger Rights, and this is the Sunday afternoon Air Passenger Rights update live on your Facebook page. We are going to start momentarily. I'm just wondering how the audio and the video is and uh, how many people are already here. I'm hearing from Dominic that we are getting good audio and video and uh, Christine is telling me she's still here. So uh, it's all good. And as always, I would like to start with thanking our volunteers, Dominic, Christine, Martin, and Terry, who helped us to get through yet another week, another week full of questions, of answers, of developments. And on today's agenda, we are going to talk about how we take our activism on social media to the next level, how uh, we are coping with chargeback issues, good and bad news, and we are also going to talk about human rights issues at the airport and air transportation, which seems to be under assault now again. But before we start, and I'm, I mentioned to you a number of times before, I'm sure, uh, that trying things and dealing with these air passenger rights issues is it takes a lot of patience um my father always told me when i was a kid that there is no royal road to mathematics nor to anything else he was i guess paraphrasing what euclid told to ptolemy the fourth um the pharaoh who wanted uh, euclid to teach him geometry easily he wanted a very easy way to mathematics to geometry Time, and he was told there is no royal road. There is only hard work with, with lots of work, lots of toiling, and eventually you have some results. And I wanted to mention to you that, that I have recently seen a proof of that. A number of weeks ago, I, I was telling you about my experiments with uh, sourdough bread. And first of, of course, I know that as like all of you who have tried it for the first time, ended up with some uh, flat, hard, uh, objects that re didn't really resemble anything like a bread and I kept trying so I'd like to show you I just got this out of the oven today this is after several weeks probably over, close to two months of experiments so the reason I'm showing it to you other than of course some free advertising for uh, our new baker business, just kidding, uh, is that if you keep trying the same thing, eventually you will succeed. If it is something which is physically possible, if you are trying to, to do something which is well within reason, it may take some time, it may take some experience, but you will eventually get there. And uh, uh, this is uh, this is a lesson for all of us about how we are treating air passenger rights and our efforts to get refunds to all of us. And I'm seeing now on my screen a bunch of uh, highs and hellos. So I'm seeing you all. I just, uh, there are too many names here, people saying hello to me to say hello to everybody, but I have heard you, I've seen you. Let's talk first about uh, taking our social media campaign to the next level. You may have seen already in the group that the airline's new attempt is to get people to book more flights. The airlines want passengers to book flights now, and well, if things don't work out, I guess they will keep your money, like they have been doing before. This is wrong at multiple levels, and we need to fight back on that. It is wrong because they are trying to get more people to participate in what looks like at this point, more like a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid game than an actual genuine business. Normally in a genuine business, you take the money, which is unearned revenue, and you don't use it up until you actually deliver the services. But right now, because airlines are bleeding money, and that's undisputed fact that they are bleeding money, your money is not safe with the airlines. Right now, there is no mechanism that would ensure that if your flight is canceled and the airline is not able to deliver the services they 
promise to deliver to you, you will be seeing back your money. So they are trying, they are looking for more suckers. And we need to do something to protect our fellow passengers, fellow Canadians, and passengers internationally from falling victims to unscrupulous Canadian airlines. The other aspect is, which is perhaps a more matter of self-interest, is that it would be important to get across to the airlines the message that until such time as they are providing refunds, they are not really going to succeed in getting new customers. So uh, our first order of business, therefore, is uh, that we have to make a concentrated effort to draw awareness, to draw attention in, within Canada and internationally to the deceptive attempts by the airlines to encourage passengers to buy tickets, while actually they don't necessarily have the means to deliver the services and they are not willing to have any arrangement in place to ensure that if your flight is cancelled, you will be getting back your money, that passengers who buy tickets will be getting back their money, even if they book now. So uh, in terms of social media, if you can design some nice images, some nice memes, anything, any kind of message, especially on Twitter, that we can disseminate is very helpful. Please make sure to tag uh, AirPass Ride CA, our uh, Twitter handle. That way we are also able to retweet it. Have a look at where uh, the various airlines are advertising on Twitter. So for example, they may put out some beautiful looking image uh, showing some exotic destination and telling people you should book with us. Find those on Air Canada's social media channels and any other travel agency that would post it and make sure that underneath your post will be the first one telling them, hey, you owe me so much money and I still haven't received it. So don't take money from other people. Don't be duped by those airlines that are engaging in deception, that are actually not providing the services and stealing the public's money. Another initiative that I've been thinking about, which may become timely soon, is short videos that you can record and then perhaps we can collect them uh, videos of maybe five to ten seconds where you are uh, summarizing how much money and which airline stole from you. It has to be brief because my idea is to put those videos together into one longer video that we can put out. So things like short segment, Air Canada stole $3,500 from me and that's the whole video or maybe something like uh, Air Canada stole $3,500 from me. Don't let them steal from you too. Very, some very short, simple messages on video. You can also post it on Twitter actually in response to some of those ads. And if you would like to participate in a project like this, when you record such a video of yourself and you send me the short video segments, we can look into how we can make a, a nice, uh, ultimate video from it. We can discuss the text. Perhaps there should be a concluding text where everybody says the same thing at the end. Something like, uh, do not fly Canadian or do not buy Canadian from Canadian Airlines. It's maybe too long. So something very short. If you can suggest a, a short phrase, um, something like don't fly Canadian, uh, that would be helpful. Any kind of creativity that we can put here would be a good investment of our time because the airlines have to understand that if they are not refunding you, if they continue this unlawful behavior, this is going to hit their bottom lines. That's where we can put the most pressure on them. Yes, of course, we're doing a class action. Yes, of course, we're doing lobbying. Yes, of course, we are doing uh, various uh, work with various um, players to ensure that you get back your money. But if the airlines understand that they will be at loss here, that they are going to face significant financial losses if they don't fix the situation, they will be the first people to fix it. It has to become a financial interest for the airlines to refund you. Uh, Diana wants to know how much I charge for a loaf. Oh, that's an interesting question. No, you know, we are always doing pro bono. Uh, 
uh, Diana, back to the question about the loaf. We are always, we help people out pro bono. So uh, once this madness with COVID-19 is over, perhaps we can have a nice garden party. I will make a number of breads here for people here in Halifax. We can all come and try some um, uh, sourdough bread. Uh, Mac Berry uh, is asking, uh, has an interesting pending post about airlines taking temperatures with the potential of being like boarding on that basis. Um, Mac, I understand that sometimes posts don't get posted right away. You have to bear in mind that we have an approval queue. After this show, probably I'm going to go through our approval queue and perhaps uh, if Dominic in the meantime can look at it, uh, he may be able to provide, to provide some feedback. I am glad you're uh, raising this question. If your post doesn't show up right away, it doesn't mean that we don't care. It just means that we are busy, we are dealing with other matters. And as soon as the post is uh, getting reviewed and uh, it will be posted, we just make sure that the posts are complete, that they make sense to a third party reader and that there is enough information there for us to answer the question. Even if we decline a post, Typically, in the vast majority of the cases, we are going to provide some feedback. We are going to provide some explanation as to why the post was declined and what we would like you to do to repost. Uh, and uh, Terry is saying she can assist with posting too, as well, of course. Um, so uh, what Mac Berry's uh, post is asking here is about the fact that now the government made some rules that people who have an above normal body temperature will be denied boarding on flights. The measures themselves are quite rational and reasonable. I take no uh, issue with them, although I don't think they go far enough. I would want to see perhaps blood tests being done if, the, if there are spot tests that are available at the airport before anybody boards. The main issue I have from a passenger rights perspective is what happens with the money of those passengers who are denied boarding because their body temperature is elevated. Those passengers should be refunded promptly, not only because it's the right thing by some law, but also because it's a practical thing. We don't want people to be hiding their illness, to hiding their uh, ailment, to how their temperature may be taken aspirin before they go to the airport out of fear that at the airport they may be denied boarding and then they will be out of money. So those health measures are good, don't go far enough, but have to be accompanied by appropriate financial measures to ensure that the passengers are not incurring financial losses. And in terms of the, uh, back to the idea of short videos, I'm open to all suggestions and really it is only the sky is the limit. There is so much I can do on my own. I'm not an expert in video editing. I have very rudimentary tools to uh, merge videos. I can do some very basic things, but I don't have a full uh, editing uh, suite here that would be suitable for this type of uh, activities. Uh, even for this uh, Facebook Live matters, I'm I'm just learning how it works and uh, you have seen me here, those who have been following this uh, page for long enough from day one, that I'm learning just how to do this live broadcast myself. I, I never even had the software for doing live uh, videos before. So uh, certainly if you have creative ideas, if you have, if you want to put your anger, your well, uh, justified anger about what the airlines have been doing into good use, into something productive, positive, then creating nice images that explain in, in one look that those airlines are essentially stealing the public's money. If you can make short videos, uh, possibly videos that we can combine into a bigger, longer piece, it is all welcome. I'm very open to any such discussion. Uh, let's see what, where we can take this. Let's make sure that airlines get the message that they cannot, on the one hand, steal the public's money and then come for, back for more for passengers. Uh, Leigh Hammond is asking about protests. What about protests? I don't think that in the current situation with COVID-19, a protest would necessarily be a good idea or would be an effective idea. You know, we are, even if all 32,000 people from the group showed up at 
Air Canada CEO's doorstep, which is not likely to happen. Uh, it would still be a one-time event. It would maybe be embarrassing. It may get some media attention, but it's not going to put a long-term pressure and incentive on the airlines to comply with the law. If the airlines understand that what they are doing is hitting their bottom line, that there are all these posts left, right, and center about them owing money to people, and that other people will not be buying from them as a result, then they are going to start changing. Uh, Debbie is asking, temper checks accuracy. I've known parents that send their kids to daycare after using Tylenol to take the fever down when they are sick. Passengers can and will do the same. And Debbie, that's exactly the reason that I think that in a current situation, airlines should be refunding passengers with no questions asked. I would even say, if, even if someone phones the airline and says, you know, I think I may have a fever. I don't want to go to the airport to ascertain it because I don't want to possibly infect other people. The airline should be just refunding money to the credit card, not vouchers, back to the credit card, effectively treating all tickets as fully refundable for these purposes. Because overall, when you look at the travel business, look at the impact on the economy, it would save way more money. Currently, as it stands, the best advice I can give passengers is don't travel. Don't book travel because your money is not safe. The airlines can steal it by just canceling the flight for their own economic reasons, and they can also steal it by refusing your boarding, possibly because you may have a mundane cold or a small fever for reasons other than COVID-19. And when you want back your money, they're going to tell you, too bad, so sad. In such a climate, don't take your business to those airlines. The airlines have to understand that if they want our business, we have to have some level of security, of safety, of knowing that if for whatever reason, outside our fault, we cannot travel, we are not going to be penalized for it. In terms of, I'm just looking here a little bit through the list of questions. Um, in terms of uh, our next topic, I would like to talk to you about something that uh, I think is going to uh, be familiar to you because the experience of airlines pocketing the money of passengers who have not been able to travel is not unique to what is happening now. It has been happening on a smaller scale before. Let's talk now about human rights at the airports. There are two aspects that when, you, when I was thinking about this topic that come to my mind. One is the treatment of passengers with disabilities. The other is the treatment of persons of color, of persons who belong to various ethnic minorities. The situation is quite grim for both. I would like to start off with an article. It's an article from um, uh, the National Post. It's about five years ago, if I will manage to post it. Um, and uh, it's an article about uh, the famous violinist Yitzhak, Yitzhak Perlman, uh, who, as you probably see in the picture, relies on a scooter, on a mobility device, because of his disability. He's one of the world's top violinists. And when he arrived in Toronto back in 2015, the attendant who was supposed to assist him throughout from deboarding, from, de from uh, disembarking from the plane all the way to getting his baggage to leaving the airport, it's at some point just abandoned him. That's it. So the treatment that he received, and I hope you're going to read the article, is not unique, unfortunately. To those of us who are fortunate to be uh, able-bodied and don't suffer of any physical disabilities, the hardship that persons with physical disabilities, especially those who are wheelchair-bound, undergo when they travel by air is immense. It's difficult to even phantom what some people have experienced, for example, by being denied the opportunity to go to the bathroom. 
the attendant says, well, I won't take you to the bathroom. I'm just going to leave you here in your wheelchair and tough luck. There have been a number of attempts and efforts to fix the situation. Unfortunately, of course, those are handled by the same Canadian Transportation Agency, which believes that giving you vouchers instead of cash is cool. So they issued some half-baked regulations last summer, and those regulations were supposed to come into force on the 25th of June this year, 2020. So today, as I was preparing for this show, I opened up again Canada Gazette, and what I found is that our uh, government, in their infinite wisdom, has decided to postpone those regulations that would have somewhat made travel a bit easier for persons with disabilities until the end of this year. All this because of they are feeling so sorry for the various corporations that provide transportation, in particular airlines. Some of the issues that I have witnessed, I've been involved in, that I would like to mention, uh, involve, for example, persons with uh, visible, with, uh, um, limited vision, with, with uh, eyesight visibility, and uh, passengers who rely on the service of service dogs. In 2015, two women who were supposed to travel to their vacation with their guide dogs, experienced travelers, were actually booted from a Jet Airways flight from Toronto to Europe for no good reason. The dogs were calm, they are seasoned travelers, but some of the airline's employees, apparently, for various reasons, didn't like the idea of having to have a dog on board, even though we are talking about seeing guide dogs, not emotional support, and not any of those areas which I realize for some people is contentious, but actually dogs that were trained by the world top organization for training service dogs, seeing eye. They have traveled many times with these dogs and it was just that specific airline, Jet Airways, that decided to uh, eject them. Now, maybe the karma has reached Jet Airways because they are going through a bankruptcy, but their situation and situations of this nature were persons with legitimate service dogs certified by seeing eye or other disabilities, such as being wheelchair bound, are being humiliated in air transportation are not unique. We just don't see them, don't hear about them. But next time you travel, you just pay attention to that. I'm seeing now some questions. I'm going to answer them and then come back to other issues of human rights. Uh, Tareen Milway is asking, are there certain US airlines who are refunding if you are sick? Excellent question. I don't know the answer. I don't know whether the US has been implementing this kind of temperature measurement uh, measures. It would be worth checking. Helen is asking, how about formally informing the European Union that Air Canada has incorrectly rewritten their long delay and flight cancellation notice? Helen, this is an excellent proposal, and if you would like to do it, go for it. If you would like me to review your draft, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to provide you with some guidance on how such documents should be written in a kind of professional language, not, not as a kind of a whiny consumer, but rather more in a legal style of, okay, this is what the law, this is what it has been, this is what they do now. I would also suggest, though, Helen, that you complain about that change to Air Canada's uh, policies to each and every national enforcement body in the European Union. So English is probably easy for you, then uh, you can write to the national enforcement body in the UK, the uh, Civil Aviation Authority. You can also write to their counterpart in Ireland. They are a different body, that would be a good start. In Germany, they may or may not welcome a text in English in this context, but probably they are definitely capable, they are, they are capable of, of dealing with it. I wouldn't suggest writing necessarily to a Hungarian um, national enforcement body in English, that, that, that may be a challenge for them. Uh, I'm from Hungary, so I guess that's always the, the they're, they're my, my laughing stock for, for uh, all those jokes. But Germany certainly is a, is a modern country, they will probably welcome it in English. 
Netherlands probably will. Uh, in France, you may want to write a letter in French. Uh, Belgium, French, English, both would be a good idea. And so put the pressure not just in one place. Of course, informing the uh, European Union's uh, commission for who is in charge of transportation might be a good idea, but uh, it is the national enforcement bodies that have to do this. Debbie is asking, I have read a num numerous posts on travel forums where people have booked for July and three days after Canadian Airlines have already cancelled on them and will only receive credit vouchers. Well, Debbie, this is exactly the reason that I recommend not to book. Those people who had this recent cancellation should, of course, proceed to a chargeback on the basis of services not received. But this is exactly the reason that I recommend people to not book Canadian, do not fly with Canadian Airlines until they change their behavior. Another question by Amir, what is the current status around the court proceedings against the CTA as well as the class action lawsuits? Um, Amir, with respect to the CTA, uh, the Federal Court of Appeal still has all cases suspended and they're slowly gradually going to unsuspend them. Uh, the, um, we had a quick um, interlocutory in motion for, for, uh, motion for interlocutory injunction, which was denied. But the judge made some good findings that we can use, at least in the interim, to help passengers to raise questions about what the Canadian Transportation Agency is doing. We are going to pursue that matter once it is unfrozen, once it is, once it is uh, resumed. Uh, it will have to go to a hearing before a panel of three judges. With respect to the class actions, uh, I know about the federal one and the Passenger side filed a letter explaining why it should go ahead as quickly as possible. Now it is the airline's turn to file materials in the coming days. I don't know what exactly the deadline is. Perhaps it will be this coming uh, Monday. I don't remember the deadlines by heart. I don't have it. In, there was a, a direction coming out from the court about this, but I don't have it right in front of me. And then uh, I suspect, as I recall, I'm going by memory again in the next case conference is sometime in late June, June, on June 22nd, 25th, forget the exact date. But at that point, uh, the judge is going to convene the parties again, and that probably at that point, the judge is going to start setting timelines for bringing the matter to a hearing, because it seems that the court understands very well this is an urgent matter that needs a ruling one way or another to clarify what the passenger's rights are. And Linda is mentioning here, I'm not sure whether it's a comment or a question, uh, Greece are testing everyone that enters. And, you know, generally testing people who enter a country is, is a sound measure. I think that, that it's something that should be happening in every country. The, there is a question of who should be bearing the cost of that. But generally, if you enter a country and there is a chance that you may be carrying some kind of infectious disease, you should be tested. That's a reasonable measure. Let's come back to the issue of uh, human rights, because there is something that, that I've been noticing for the past five years happening uh, that you should be aware of. Just imagine showing up to the airport, wanting to go on a vacation or visit relatives in a different country. Show up at the airport and the airline employees start questioning you about how much money you have in your bank account, what do you work, where do you intend to stay, do you really have enough money to be at a destination, why do you even want to go to the destination? Things that are generally none of their goddamn business. And these are airline employees who are doing that. And then once you have answered those questions, they take uh, photos of your passport, take, take it away and then come back and tell you, you know what, you cannot board this, air, this flight. We won't allow you to travel to your country destination. And we won't even give you a refund. Sounds familiar? Have you had this kind of thing happen to you? Or maybe, you can relate to this experience just because of what we are seeing now with airlines refusing to give refunds. Well, that experience has been happening to many hundreds, quite possibly thousands of passengers who wanted to board flights from Europe to Canada. The typical target of this type of racism are people of color. Now, who are people of color in Europe? This would primarily in Eastern Europe, be people who belong to the Roma, Romani minority, or as some people would call them, gypsies. I've, I became aware of this issue starting 2015, when I began to hear 
rumors and newspaper articles about passengers trying to board a flight to Canada and being refused boarding at the instruction, the verbal instruction from various people from Canadian Embassy in Vienna, the of CBSA, or various other Canadian authorities who then tell the passenger, oh, it was the airline's decision not to let you board. And of course, the airline is telling the passenger, it was CBSA's decision not to let you board. So they're all pointing fingers back and forth to each other. And there is a passenger who lost their money, cannot see their relatives, and being humiliated in public by the situation. The racism that we are hearing about, which even we even heard uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau acknowledge that we have racism in Canada, happens everywhere. And it happens also and in a heightened level when you're dealing with the CBSA, when how CBSA deals with people whom they consider for based on their own racist ideas as, as criminals just because of their ethnicity, just because their skin is more brown than mine or yours. Some of those uh, cases have been reported by the media. I, I'm going to mention two of those. There, was a, uh, there were several reports uh, in, on, in CBC in October 2015. Mind you, it was at a time a Harper government. And uh, not surprisingly, the Global Mail was also quite up in arms and published an editorial um, entitled Canadian Flirting with Racism in European Airports. Both articles are very much worth reading because they raise valid points, valid concerns about how us Canadians are operating abroad, how we treat people who want to come and visit Canada, bona fide as they are genuine visitors, yet because their skin is darker, we Canadians, our authorities are treating them differently. It is also remarkable though about how little discussion has been happening about this pressing issues which we Canadians are doing after the change of governments. So the, the unfortunate reality is that these practices have continued even after uh, the change of government. So it's not something that can be simply blamed on, oh, it was the Harper government. Well, no, it was not. The Trudeau government is guilty at least as much, if not more, of the same, perpetuating the same practices that uh, cannot be described in different terms of racism. The recent cases that I'm aware of, as recent as last year, were a couple, a Roma, Hungarian Roma couple, showed up at the airport in Budapest. They wanted to visit uh, the sister of the wife in the couple because uh, the sister was undergoing uh, an abdominal surgery at a hospital in Toronto, and they wanted to be at her bedside, which I would say is quite normal. I'm sure that if your sister was going through a serious a surgery, you would want to be there to support them. They show up at the airport, they were questioned by Air Canada's agents, and then the agent took away their papers, came back and told them, no, sorry, you cannot travel. And the biggest problem with you is that the status of your relatives in Canada, uh, that's the reason why you cannot travel. Th the background is that their relatives in Canada were granted refugee status. They are not refugee claimants. They are not dubious uh, people who are in Canada unlawfully. They were granted refugee status by the um, refugee board. And the Canadian authorities seem to be after people who are Roma, whom can be identified by having relatives who are Roma, who were granted refugee status. Uh, so uh, those cases are ongoing. And I would like to show you something that I found uh, particularly uh, troublesome that you should be aware of that our country is doing it too. And let me just put up. And this brave couple, I, I, I think that they are doing um, something that only very few people have the courage to do. And this brave couple have gone through the trouble of actually filing a court challenge in Canada to what CBSA has done to them. And they received some documents about why on earth all this happened to them. And this is what they received. 
And the, all that blacking out is not by me. That is by Canadian authorities that are trying to use national security as a smokescreen to withhold information about what actually happened. And mind you, we're talking about people who have uh, real estate in Hungary, who have their jobs in Hungary, who you know have a life there, and they visited in Canada before, went back, they are not, and by any stretch of imagination, attempting to immigrate in Canada illegally. But based on this, some information that Air Canada gave to CBSA, they were labeled as uh, immigrants without a visa, in, intending to immigrate without a visa. And the actual indicators based on which they reached this conclusion is be, still being withheld. That's still a matter that a court is looking into because the uh, uh, Canadian authorities are using national security as a smokescreen to actually disclosing the true reasons why these people and why many people in a similar situation have been refused boarding on a flight and at the same time just like you are not getting back their tickets either so when canada is talking about racism when canada is talking about this is happening in canada too well it's very true it's happening to people in canada but it is happening also to people who are bona fide visitors who want to visit Canada and then because of the color of their skin, they're being discriminated against. And it is a collusion between the government and the airlines, just like the collusion that we are seeing with respect to your refunds. Next time when you hear about racism, uh, human rights issues on flights, remember that it is not what it seems like. It is not the government trying to protect you necessarily from genuine threats of terrorism, but rather the government is using those kind of pretexts in national security to simply target people because of their color, because of their race. Uh, and I see here another question I'm going to answer it, and then we are going to move on to talk about chargebacks. Uh, uh, Tarulata Patel is asking, we had problems that airlines don't want to give a refund or vouchers. They said that you use uh, one-way tickets, partials, so now they can't refund or voucher. So what we can do with airlines? The rule is very simple. If you didn't get some services that you paid for, they have to pay you back for it. Now, if you used some of the segments, say you had a round-trip ticket and you used the outbound segments, then of course you don't have to be refunded for those segments that you have already used but they certainly have to refund you for those segments which are unused so you, you need to file a charge on your credit card on the basis of services not received that's that's the bottom line here these are not you don't have to pay for something that you have not received and i'm going now back to the issue of um chargebacks we have had a very strange week. The, the pro positive thing I can uh, uh, report is actually I'm being told I missed a question. Just one moment. Um, for the countries that test you upon entering their country, how can you possibly know that the test results are true and not a money grab by some corrupt government employees? Uh, and, uh, Diana, I don't know how you can know whether the tests are accurate. That's part of a problem. And uh, this is one more reason why the current time I would not want to travel. I want to stay here in Canada where at least we are safe. We don't have to uh, quarantine ourselves in our own province more than you know, some kind of uh, social distancing. So back to the issue of chargebacks. Um, the two issues that we, we had from the last week is issues with uh, Rogers MasterCard and issues with American Express. With Rogers MasterCard, I've had some positive communications with MasterCard International. And what I'm seeing just lately is that at least in the intake level, there is more cooperation. In some cases where passengers were previously told that they could not do a charge because their ticket was non-refundable, which is ridiculous as a reason, uh, they are now reopening those files. So if it happened to you, phone them back, be assertive, ask for a supervisor, because there was, as I understand, a clear reminder from uh, the top down 
that Rogers MasterCard has to abide by MasterCard International's rules. Uh, the other aspect with respect to American Express, I do see the growing number of problems there. And uh, so far, I can tell you that one Amex cardholder had a courage to already tell them that I'm not going to pay this amount, I'm clawing it back from my bill. That email was just sent out last night. It is a last resort. I'm not suggesting doing it until after you've exhausted all other possibilities. But those credit card issuers, whether it is Amex or Visa, have to understand that it is your money. And if they are not going to follow the law, you're going to claw back the money. And if they don't like it, guess what? They have to take you to court. So we are still trying to work with Amex, but Amex is being very combative. I do wonder whether part of the reason is that they are both the issuing bank and uh, the credit card, and perhaps because they may ha be having additional financial arrangements with the airlines. I don't know what exactly the reason is, but they have been so far the most combative. So if you were to choose a new credit card now, do not go to American Express. At this point, I cannot suggest in a good faith, in a good heart, that in a good conscience, that uh, you do business with American Express. We are now working on trying to get as much help to people who are victims of American Express as possible. One of the problems that I'm having is that there are always cases in the, in the rebuttal assistance queue that are time sensitive, that people have a strict deadline, and I have to jump on in on those first. But with American Express, certainly I would like to look at, hopefully in this coming week, fingers crossed, a little bit catching up with those uh, American Express cases and, and send them rebuttal letters, make it clear that the airline submitted fraudulent documents, fraudulent arguments, which is what usually has happening. And if American Express doesn't want to listen to this, the next step is clawing back the money from your bill. How you do it? You spend down as much money on your, on your American Express card as is equal to the amount in dispute. And then you advise them, sorry, I've already paid for it once. To be clear, I'm not advocating for not paying your bill altogether. I'm not advocating for just ignoring the demands for payment. The purpose is not to act unlawfully, but to act well within the confine of the law, but make it clear to American Express that you are not kidding. Once, once they receive 10 or 20 of those letters telling them that you know what, I'm not going to pay those illegitimate charges. They will start thinking how to deal with it. Once they receive 100 or 200 of those, they know that they will be in trouble because the cost and the energy to just collect on those is not going to be worth it. I've been thinking also about the, the um, structure of the problem. A typical delinquent credit card or card holder owes charges coming from a variety of billers. Then, of course, the easiest path is to go after a cardholder. And those card, gross credit card co uh, companies, especially Amex, is trying to go by the path of least resistance. What we need to do with Amex especially is to make sure that the cardholder is not the path of least resistance because there is, a, there is the airline from whom the money can be taken back. And that trying to get back the money from tens or hundreds of cardholders who unanimously refuse to pay legitimate charges will just be more onerous than trying to get uh, the airline the merchant to pay for it and reach some understanding with them. That's, that's the big picture. It's a picture, it's something about uh, investment of energy, investment of resources on the other side, because you know to, to not, not pay a bill in a legal way and making sure that you, are, you put into writing what is it you're not paying, why you're not paying, what is your legal basis for not paying, it's really a small effort. You want to put your credit card company in a situation where they are running after their money, not you are running after your money. You want them to be the ones who are trying to make you pay and you say, well, sorry, you have an address for your concerns, please contact the merchant. Right now, they are telling you to go with the merchant. You want to basically turn the coins and, and turn the table on them and, and say, well, you know what? Now you will be the one going to the merchant trying to collect your money because you're not going to pay that money from me. If you don't like it, take me to court. Sue me. 
those credit card companies have good enough lawyers who will tell them that the odds of winning a case when you as a, as a card holder you don't receive the, the services are very slim. Judges look at the basic contract law perspective, basic consumer law perspective. You are not, it's not the case when you actually took the goods and then disappeared. Then you would have no sympathy. But given that you yourself received nothing in exchange for your money, I don't think that a credit card company or the merchants will have much sympathy in the situation. Two questions. Colin is asking activism. There has been a round table of travel industry and airline representatives calling for the Canadian government to change COVID rules at airports and quarantine requirements and encourage Canadians to travel again. Could you ask your viewers to make their feelings known about refunds and changing COVID rules on Twitter? Uh, uh, hashtag time to travel. This is the roundtable Twitter account. Well, Colin, I very much support what you are saying. That's why I mentioned it earlier. We need to use the Twitter hashtag. I think it's a good idea. Time to travel. Well, perhaps maybe add something ahead of it. Uh, you know, another hashtag not or maybe fraud. Um, we need to use the hashtags that uh, those airlines, travel industry players are using and use that also to push our message if someone looks at a hashtag they are going to run across our message possibly even more of our message than their messages but we need to make it clear by tagging to each positive message they try to put out five negative messages of of how your money was stolen by the airlines that this is not going to work people are not going to be traveling until such time as their money can be safe maxime is asking um the, the question regarding when an airline cancelled a portion of the flight itinerary. Air Canada cancelled all domestic flight from uh, Bagotville to Montreal weeks ago, but not my flight Montreal to Frankfurt. Uh, can I ask refund or, or ask for a chargeback? Maxime, if you cannot get to Montreal to begin with, of course the ticket is useless. You are not being provided the service services you paid for, which was from your origin to your destination. So of course that you can ask for first a refund, we expect Air Canada to refuse, and then you proceed to a chargeback. That's a very clear case. Amir is asking, would clawbacks not hurt people's credit scores? If you just clawback money or refuse to pay a bill and do nothing, of course it would be a very bad idea. It would be a terrible idea. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting to document what you're doing, to send a letter. Every time they send you a bill, which is say, now you owe this much plus interest, send back a letter, no, I don't owe this. I refuse to pay it. It's not a legitimate charge. If they try to put something on your on your credit report, contact the reporting uh, company, dispute it there, and if necessary, bring it to the registrar. And Ontario is a registrar for credit reporting and, and uh, take it up there. The point is to move away from the fight from you trying to get back your money to them trying to get back their money. And given that you receive no services in return, it is very hard to, to make that argument that you owe something when you did not receive anything in return. Uh, and also, if, if you're concerned about, uh, Terry is telling me uh, that if someone is concerned about their credit rating, they can put a note on their file by calling the credit reporting agency. So uh, yes, there are lots of ways with the credit reporting Aspect. It's not like it's not like they can just you know do whatever they want to you. Also, if they put false information on credit report, that's a form of defamation. All of a sudden, they have converted a mere claim for a couple hundred dollars, a couple thousand dollars against you, into possibly you claiming tens of thousands of dollars against them for defamation. So, the from the perspective of the credit card company, this is going to be a bad idea, and we have to make it clear, make sure it's going to be a bad idea, something that they, go, they are going to lose money on overall, lose reputation overall. Also, in the current times, there will be thousands, if not tens of thousands of people genuinely not being able to pay their credit cards. So, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, um, if you otherwise diligently paying all your other bills, everything, it's not like you're, you just, uh, stop paying and become a become a delinquent then the potential uh, impact can be very 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 minor especially since you're going to document it so the, the the point is not just stop responding but rather each time they send you a bill 
send a letter in response by email, by fax, something that doesn't cost you money. Think them, I deny you this, I dispute this amount, I don't accept this. We are going to come up with some templates to do that. The point is that, that make sure that there is a clear paper trail that you insist that if they want that money, they have to take you to court. In Ontario, we have checked previously that under the um, debt collection uh, regulatory regime, if you tell that collector, you know what, I'm disputing this debt, take me to court over this, they cannot contact you again. The Ontario rules about it are quite clear. So all this about debt collection and rating and so on, it is for people, it is meant to deal with situations with people who are trying to disappear, who are trying to act in bad faith. Not with people like you and me, who openly state that this is not a legitimate claim, I'm disputing this and I'm happy to deal with it in court and just submit court papers if you think I owe you money. Uh, Jacinth Leclerc is asking, many people were offered a voucher. My tour operator canceled uh, and 100% non-refundable, no vouchers. It is common to have, not at all. Uh, they cannot just run away with your money. That's a perfect reason for a chargeback and possibly clawing back the money from the credit card if they are not doing their job. Remember, in most provinces in Canada, a chargeback is not simply the good intentions of your uh, credit card company. It's a legal right. It's in your Consumer Protection Act. In Ontario, it's uh, Section 99. In Quebec, I think it's Section 40. Uh, 54, I think, or 51. You need to double I don't know it by heart, but uh, we, we posted it. If you look at the uh, announcements, uh, the post pinned to the top has a link which links to all these consumer protection laws collected in one post. So the information is available there for you. In many provinces, it's a legal right, so they're not doing you a favor. You are doing them a favor in some way by doing business with them. So don't 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 feel that that you need to be concerned. It is your money. Just think about this way. Suppose that uh, someone is trying to take away your car. You left your car in a parking lot, and they don't want to let you take your car. But you can just go in there. You have the keys. Get in your car and drive out. If they have a problem with it. They should take you to court about it. It's your goddamn car. That's the mentality, that's the mindset you should have about your money. It's your money. It's not theirs money, not their money. You are entitled to take it back because there's nothing you got in return. One more twist I would add to it. If they are adamant that vouchers are good enough, I would offer to assign the voucher to the credit card company in lieu of payment. If they think it's an acceptable payment, hey, here's my vouchers. Have a nice day. The point is, again, that you are not just refusing to pay without any communication, without any clear reason, without uh, any clear justification. And you keep paying every other amount except for the amount of dispute and any interest associated with it. Of course, those things you don't pay. And one more question, one more question from Larry. If you refuse to pay for a denial chargeback and then the CC or credit reporting agencies try to collect it, what would it eventually lead to a poor relationship with your bank? Well, I think that if the bank is refusing to give you back the money that is owed to you, Larry, the bank has a poor relationship with you. So I would say perhaps even close the account there and move, into, move to a different financial institution. Generally, what we are seeing is that MasterCard has been quite reasonable. That's the overall image I'm getting so far. That MasterCard seems to be way more cooperative, uh, way more reasonable in their policies and their approach to these matters. And we are going to keep monitoring it. So it's not like you won't have a choice. Perhaps, uh, you know, American Express, they're being complete uh, stonewalling to passengers, complete uh, hostile, really hostile, no problem. You can move to a different MasterCard, different bank. And those things are also going to show in terms of the bottom lines of those companies, which is what we want. We want to make sure that there are consequences for those companies that misbehave, that don't respect the rights of passengers, that don't respect consumer rights. Ted is asking, Air Transit is referring to CTA statement from March. Uh, the answer is simple. A reference to a CTA statement from March, given that also there were additional statements from April, is fraud. It's a fraudulent uh, attempt to fraudulently mislead passengers about their rights. And I would call them out on it by email, by uh, social media, and call it by its name. Fraud, theft. Don't be afraid to call the child by its name. What those corporations are doing is something that in a proper society, if, if we had a proper uh, government, 
there should have already been some charges laid for what they have done. It's unfortunate that it's not happening. That's because of how the current government is handling things. And I would like to circle back to something about uh, those uh, efforts that we are making now. I think that this, the time has come that you start phoning members of parliament. Under the COVID-19, they may have had some good excuses for, uh, you know, it's special times, we don't have our office stuff, but now we are getting more back to normality a little bit. And don't just send emails because emails are very easy to answer. Here's a template, press send. That's really impractical. But if you actually phone their offices and insist to book a time to speak, that means that your member of parliament will have to spend 15 minutes of their time talking to you, listening to you, telling them what the government is doing is wrong. And what I've been told is that typically they look at those things with a multiplier of, I don't know, 500 or 1,000, depending on what their metric says, that for each call that they receive, each person actually goes through the trouble of speaking to the member of parliament. They assume there are about a couple hundred, a couple thousand people who have the same view, who share the same sentiment. So if, once you, they start getting those phone calls, and I'm saying phone calls, not just emails, phone them, leave them a message, tell them I want to speak to Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, they are, I'm one of your constituents, I want to talk to you. I, and I have, actually have the right to speak to them in a moral sense. Then they will start feeling the heat. And I would say that in part, a particular area where I would want to see more is in the writings where you have a conservative members of parliament. Some conservative MPs have been very nice in their responses, but I'm feeling a little bit uneasy about the lack of clear messaging from uh, the CPC on this issue. The Green Party has spoken out very early, actually. NDP with Nikki Ashton has been regularly holding the government accountable. The Bloc is doing the same with uh, uh, Xavier Barcelo Duval. He has done also an amazing job at time after time, like a broken record, holding the government accountable as to what is going on with refunds. Why is the government not enforcing the law? I have not been hearing the same level of criticism from the Conservative Party of Canada. And I think that, that you can do a lot to change it. You should be placing phone calls, especially if you have a Conservative MP in your writing, to their offices to insist to speak to them on the phone and ask them, okay, when is the Conservative Party going to speak out on this issue? I want to hear from you. I want to see you as my representative speak on this issue or on your part to speak on this issue. Back to a bit more questions. I've been quite vocal on, on Sunwing and various travel forums about refund issues. Do you think airlines are watching and flying us as troublemakers and may give us hard time future when it comes to boarding? Debbie, I don't think that they, are, they are, have such blacklists. On the contrary, what may happen is that next time you may get a free cocktail or a free upgrade or whatever, uh, air, especially with such issues which they know that they affect everybody. It's not that you are being a troublemaker, you're just being more vocal than other people. They know that the issues that you are bringing to the table are common issues to everybody. I will not be worried. Amir is asking now, I remember there being a post here a few weeks ago regarding some Facebook ads that notify people that in BC vendors are not able to provide time limited vouchers. So is it not illegal for airline to be providing these two year vouchers? Amir, in a number of provinces, there is a prohibition against putting time limits on gift cards and vouchers, which are basically gift cards. Uh, so yes, those are also legal. But the, the very fact, Amir, that those airlines are providing uh, vouchers and not cash itself is illegal. That's where the root of the problem starts. Now, Diane is asking, we booked a two-week trip to Chicago last fall for this coming August. If the flight goes, but we are required to quarantine, we wouldn't go. But how are we able to cancel but our money back? Then uh, I think it's a bit tricky. If we are talking about trip in August, that's a month and a half from now or more. Let's wait and see what happens. I would say that in such situations, perhaps the frustration of contract doctrine may be invoked. But let's see, you know, we may get a second wave. We don't know what is going to happen in the US. Politically, there is some unrest there uh, with demonstrations. Health-wise, I don't think that things are going there look great. Uh, there are some signs that they may be either 
having an extended first wave or may right away be going to a second wave. It's not clear what is happening there with the figures. Um, it's very hard to plan in advance, very hard to know in advance what is happening. Uh, we are approaching now the one hour mark. So I'm not seeing more questions now in the queue. Uh, I'm going to get maybe 30 seconds if my uh, wonderful team has some additional comments or additional information to provide. But if not, then probably uh, we should soon be calling it a day. Uh, keep in mind, we are going to have further updates. Uh, we are uh, working on a number of interesting things. Um, and I'm seeing now here, time check, exactly we are one hour. I don't see more questions. So let's just recap some of the things that uh, we were discussing. Um, first point to remember, Call your MP. This is the time now to start phoning your MPs. Phone as many times as you can if it doesn't go for the first time and get your friends, your family members to also phone them. You know, if you are if you're a family of, uh, say, husband, wife, um, and two kids who are grown, grown up already or you know, close to being grown up, each of them should have their 15 minutes with your MP. And each of them with your own phone number. They won't even necessarily understand if you're from the same family. They need to feel that there are many people who have your fundamental concern, want to see law and, and rule of law and law and order restored when it comes to the rights of passengers to a refund. Let's take away number one. I would like to hear about your reports uh, in the coming week about what happened when you try to call for the first time, for the second time, and be like a bloody pest. Make a nuisance of yourself. In a polite way, we're all Canadians, but we're going to be a Canadian nuisance. So keep calling until you get through, keep leaving messages, make sure that you're not giving up, just I have done with my sourdough bread. Never give up. The fight is not over until you have gotten back your money, until you have won. Second takeaway from today's show, try to think about short videos, five to 10 seconds, where you talk about how much money an airline has, has stolen from you, I would love to see those videos. I would like to see them posted. I would like to collect them. We, would, we should make something creative, something that gets the attention, something that posts well on Twitter, on possibly Instagram, even at, although not on TikTok, but maybe even on TikTok. Get the message out that the airlines have stolen the public's money and now they're trying to come for a second helping of the same theft. That message has to be out there. They have to fit in their bottom line. I think that's it for this week. Um, Depending on how things work out in terms of whether we have enough topics to uh, cover for uh, next week, we may come back next week or in two weeks. I haven't made up my mind yet, but uh, as always, we are available here in the Facebook group and we are trying to do our best to help everyone with the wonderful team of volunteers, uh, Terry and Dominic and Christine and Marty. Thank you all and thank you for being here today. Take care of yourself and enjoy the good weather with measure, with social distancing. Be well.